Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. The increasing trend with craft beers continues to have an impact on Virginia agriculture. The demand for local hops, for instance, is quite high. What does the future hold for these on-farm breweries? That'll be our focus during Ag Insights later in the program. We also have a story this week about a unique agricultural training facility in Loudoun County. Those stories and more on this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Ishy. A first-of-its-kind agriculture training facility in Northern Virginia was designed with farm employees in mind. Uh, the goal is to preserve and enhance the qualified workforce for local farm businesses. Dave Miller has the story from a vineyard just outside our nation's capital. Loudoun County has a strong heritage of farming and agritourism that is supported by the county's 1,400 farms and rural businesses. And the county wants to keep it that way and even grow it by offering programs and classes for the growing population. A new diverse agriculture school has been created to develop a workforce to meet the needs of an array of agricultural and hospitality-based businesses that call Loudoun County home. They include everything from nurseries, equine operations, vegetable farms, wineries, and hops farms. One of the missing pieces was the labor in the workforce. So we wanted to make sure that we had an education program to continue to build the farmers that, that we need. The knowledge that we have, a lot of this knowledge, is with the farmers themselves. Um, we also are working with uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension so that we're getting some good institutional education, but we're also working with our farmers to get hands-on mentoring and learning on the field and to see if these young folks or second career folks want to do this. Okay, so they got to get out in the field, they got to experiment, they got to work with their hands, they got to get, get a good day's work in, and sometimes it's a good month's work in, sometimes they're working for a couple of years, finding the different pieces of what it is they like to do. Arturo Perez is learning about winemaking and working in the vineyards. He hopes to one day become a mentor himself. Dice, bueno, a mí me gusta la agricultura porque a pasar el tiempo se está perdiendo muchísimas cosas, como... Es estar trabajando en el campo es, es bueno, nos ayuda a todos, nos ayuda a la naturaleza, ayuda al campo. So, bien, pues la agricultura es, es, algo, es algo bonito, aprende uno las cosas a cultivar, cómo, cómo son los alimentos, cómo se... Cómo crece un alimento para que nosotros ingerimos o a ver qué es lo que lleva cada nutriente de cada de ellos. The new Ag School offers a tuition-free certificate program with hands-on experience in all aspects of agriculture in the region. The bigger picture is we want to make sure we're doing newer agricultural process or and mentoring whatever the agricultural process is so that that skill set gets passed on. Not everybody's going to want to work behind a computer the rest of their days, okay? But we're training those kids to do that. I work on a computer, but I also work out in the field. Uh, I'm producing things, I'm dealing with customers, I'm dealing with business. So having that broad breath, doing, being uh, pretty good at a lot of things is what our ancestors did as good farmers. One way to preserve Loudoun's open spaces is for these agribusinesses to continue to make the land viable. Beth Sastre, an agent with Loudoun County Cooperative Extension, says the program is a fusion of educational research and learning from experienced farmers by working in the field. Well, they will 
have the opportunity to choose, okay, I like the production sector, I will love to do that. Or I like to, the hospitality sector, or I like the, the, the processing sector. So, and we have uh, wine uh, growers, we have hop growers, we have vegetable growers, tree fruit growers. So we have a very wide area of horticulture producers in our area. So it's good for them to know how uh, the diversification we have and all the sectors that each one uh, uh, are part of it. Students of the new ag school are sure to come away with a greater appreciation for what farmers and rural businesses do. The ones that really dig into the experience may even decide to start their own businesses and work with the land in Loudoun's beautiful open spaces. In Loudoun County, this is Dave Miller. Thank you, Dave, for that report. Well, this week we have a special report on the increasing trend with craft beers and the relationship with agriculture. Amy Rocher visits Stable Craft Brewing in Waynesboro, Virginia. It's coming up next during Ag Insights. So today we're in Augusta County and we're visiting Stable Craft Brewery and I'm joined by the brewery owner, Craig Nargy. Craig, thank you so much for having us out today. Yeah, thanks for coming. This is a gorgeous place. Um, I'm sure everyone can see behind us the, the scenic views that are here. How long has Stable Craft Brewery been here? Uh, Stable Craft opened in uh, May 5th of 2016. So we're coming up on our first year anniversary. Okay. And we'll have a big celebration party on the 6th this year, which is, coincides with the Kentucky Derby. And then we've also, um, I think we're doing something that most places aren't. We're gonna have five brand new beers released on the same day. Wow. And we're going to release each of those beers about uh, hour and a half, two hours apart throughout the course of the entire day. That's going to be a fun day. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. So your name, Stable Craft Brewery, implies horses, and people can see over your shoulders that you do have horses here. Tell us the history of the farm and how everything kind of came to be. Okay. Uh, the, the farm used to be called uh, Waynesboro Stables and it was a Tennessee walk-in farm. And the stable was built uh, at, a, at a monster 288 feet long, 16 and a half foot wide aisle, which is not common in, in horse barns. But that aisle was built so long to be an indoor riding uh, area training. Uh, and for the most part, the facility was, was to train the horses. And then of course, train the owner or the, or the rider after the horses were broken, started and whatnot. And through its history, they'd had uh, saddlebreds, and and then over the course of 20 years or so, it had waned, and the owner had decided to retire, and the barn had been up for sale. But in the meantime, it had been leased out, so they had hunter jumpers, they had uh, just plain boarding, keep your horse here, and leisure riding, and any number of things. And then and then at some point, uh, we found it, and we we worked with the owner at that period, and then we we purchased it. And we did a pretty pretty long evaluation period of how is this guy making money with these horses? <laughs> Why isn't this barn full? What happened? Obviously, it's a lot of work. He was an older man. He didn't want to do this anymore. Makes sense going into retirement. But he kept the property up. Mm -hmm. Beautiful place. Um, and we, we just kept exploring how can we make this work? We wanted to get out of the restaurant business, which is what I was in. and we had to do the, the return on investment and, and where did we find that return on investment and it was it 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 was called agritourism so you started as a horse farm when did the brewery come into play we started in 20 uh well let's see so we bought the farm in 2006 so we're in our 11th year uh, five years ago we started exploring the hop aspect of it and we started with, I started with um, like 10 plants and I had my doubts. And there, 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 there are other folks in the area that grow hops and, and do quite well. And there are some that are just do it in their backyards or some that do it on their farms. And in our example, um, I started mine in my greenhouse, quickly found out they need to be outside because we're not doing the hydroponics and, and any of that stuff. Right. And when we got them outside, they just took off. And it was like, wow, what's going on here? You know, green thumb or magical yeah, or something. Hey. But 
the species of plant had a lot to do with it. Uh, and so we had some guidance there. And uh, we started with rhizomes, which we later learned was not the best move. Um, and just a little piece on that, a rhizome is very much like getting a grape, grapevine. If the grapevine's 10 years old, you just got a 10 year old grape cutting. And a rhizome's really not much different. It's gonna act in like the age of the plant for the okay. most part. And it could carry, if there's a blight that's associated with the soil where it came from, you could potentially bring that in. And, and there's, some, there's some areas that you should look at closely with rhizomes. Um, so the second year we, we, we upped it to 100 plants and it did really well <laughs> again. So what did you do with the hops when you were growing these? The first, the, the first round we didn't do anything with them because we just wanted the plants to mature and you know an, 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 an underdeveloped uh, hop cone flower um, may or may not have the proper lupulin which is the oil gland that we're looking for for the flavoring and the bittering aspects okay. uh, which goes into beer and uh, so we, we just we used them more as tests we, we dried some, we put some in the freezer, we just left some out. Um, we, we just played with them, we just experimented right. to see what, what is this product gonna do. I didn't think that we had the proper lupulin oils in the first round, so we just left it alone. And we did send them off for testing and a few of them came back good and a few of them came back underdeveloped. Okay. And so year two, then we noticed that our flowers started feeling more like little plump pine cones. And that, that was kind of an indicator that we were... And that's what you want, that's that exactly, plumpness, right? But yeah, we want the, the... It's a flower, so if, if you can actually put the flower in your hand and it has a little bit of weight to it, uh, a noticeable difference than, than a feather to a, you know, maybe a quarter or a couple quarters in your hand. Okay. Um, that, that, that we started realizing that, that this is where we want to be. So let's talk about the hops for a little bit because you're the only brewery in the valley right now that that grows their own hops for their beer production and the valley's pretty big so i think that's pretty accurate i think so and it's really interesting because you and i were talking a little bit earlier how time consuming that growing hops is walk us through the process of of the hop planting and the growing and the harvest and what it takes is I think some people may not realize all the work that goes involved in in harvesting the little hops <laughs> right uh, well from start to finish you have a perennial plant underground and you have an annual plant above ground okay. so they're gonna come back every year with the exception of you know a plant decide to quit on you over the winter or it didn't go into uh, it needs a shorter period of, of dormancy and then we need about 120 days of growth in the, from the time they start sprouting. So early in the season, we want to hit them with nitrogen, um, you know, March, maybe even okay. late February, and then another dose um, a little bit later in March, and then maybe just a small feeder here and there, a fish emulsion or something like that through the feeder um, irrigation system. But we have to cut them back at the beginning, and then uh, we'll start picking shoots that are coming out that we want to keep. So at what point do you run your, your lines, your strings or your wire, your lines for them to start guiding them up? So the strings will come, we, we, we always do ours about the end of April or the first of May. And we do that more because there's other things going on at the farm. So we don't necessarily have time. And then weather is always a factor this time of year because you can plan, 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 and then get rained out or a big thunderstorm or something like that. Sure. The stringing takes, you know, a solid day. And the way we do it is we have a, a wire down at the ground that we tie off to instead of penetrating the string into the ground, which is a, a more common practice. Um, and then we take the string up to the top and we loop it around so it's not tied at the top. And then it comes back down in another position adjacent to the plant or across the row. And then we have to be particular that we're not cross-contaminating one plant to the other when they grow together at some point when they meet at that top wire. So the cross-contamination would do what to that hops? So if you have a, a downy mildew or, or, or um, even a, an aphid or a bug or something that you don't want, you don't want to make it easier for them to get where they're going. Okay. So we're just trying to prevent them from growing together in clusters. Okay. Um, and we just do that by placing how the strings go up and down. And so I have a less than, um, a less than common practice on how I string and, and a less than common practice on how my hop yard works with the trellis system. 
And I did that more out of the, the frustrations of trying to keep the, the wires tight and uh, climbing up in the air 22 foot and trying to get something tight is not my favorite place to be. <laughs> right. So we changed it over to uh, two ton countermeasure blocks on either end of the hop yard, took out the crisscross and just have one wire to and from. And then we have a series of lower poles that will grow up just so we can get the mowers under. We could walk underneath. The tourists don't get hung up in your plants. Right. If the wind's blowing, it has a little more control. And we go up to that pole and then sway it over at a 45 degree angle. And then when it gets too much weight on it, we put a tow strap on the tractor and we'll just tug that two ton block okay. and everything's tightened up and we can do it all in a matter of minutes. So you said they have about a 120 day growing cycle. So when it comes time to harvest, and First of all, how many acres do you have the, under the hops? Ho the hop yards are probably uh, one and a half acres. Okay. But we, I, I measure my plants more by the, I measure my hop yards more by the plant, by the plant. than I do by the acre. And I understand okay. the acre terminology, and we hear it all the time, um, because everything goes up and not out. Right. It, it's right. it's easier. It's a little to, different. It is, and and when we join our our different organizations for hop growers or brewery associations and things, they just simply ask, how many plants do you have? Right. And then you fall into certain categories based on the plants. So how many plants do you have, Craig? About 700. <laughs> so generally, when do you harvest your hops? About August. About August, okay. So, and you say, you know, they have to be in the freezer within 24 hours. Correct. So then what happens? Walk me through the process of what you do with the hops then. How how do they get into your beers? Well, let's, let's start with, we, we we subcontracted a, a man to come in with his hop harvesting machine. And so that machine we set up in our pavilion and then we go through the yards. And as I was saying before, we don't tie the strings at the top. And so we use a machete at the bottom okay. and we leave about three foot of plant or so at the bottom so the plant can continue to grow into the fall. And you have to continue to nurture that plant all the way until you have your heaviest frost or until it decides it's done growing, for, depending on the weather here, which okay. is all over and the board. And that's mostly to keep the underground root system C correct. thriving and happy. Right. Okay. So it's still live, it's still going, even though we're collecting what we want from the plant. So then at the top of the string, we'll take a, just a painter stick and a knife and we'll cut it and we'll drop it and we'll put it on a tarp. And then that tarp will go in a pickup truck with a, with a pile of these hops stretched out so they don't get tangled. And then we'll take them up to the harvest machine and uh, cut them up and there's a whole group of people working diligently to get to get the to the fingers on the machine will strip the leaves, strip the hops, and it's it's a giant mess, but it's a organized chaos. <laughs> and then from there, they will collect the the hops into a bin, and then we'll take them and go to the refrigerator, and then cool them from field temperature to the to the 38, 40 degrees, and then make sure that we're not getting too much humidity in there and, and condensation. Okay. So at that point, then we'll put them in food saver bags and take the air out. And sometimes we'll use mylar with the tin or the tin foil looking bag, mm -hmm. and then we'll put those inside of a food saver bag and, and draw the air out. So UV light and oxygen are not our friend at that point. So they'll go in the freezer. Other places will use an oast house and they'll dry them. And then they'll take that even a step further and they'll take the fresh hop to a hammer mill and they'll have them processed into pellets. And so that is something that is in the works throughout Virginia. And there's a number of hop growers that are getting into that. And that is the preferred method for most of your brewers to have a pelletized hop. And the reason for that is you're not taking a giant bag of leaves and clogging up your equipment. Okay. So to get hops to beer, um, in, in our case, we use them typically in the boil. We'll take them from the freezer. We don't thaw them out. We'll put them in a hop sock or, a, or, or for a better way of saying that, it's just like a giant cheesecloth bag. Right. And we'll weight that bag with a stainless steel weight or something and we'll drop it into the boil kettle. And when we, when we need to dry hop a beer, then we'll have to dry our hops and, and go that direction. And we're looking at adding a hop rocket or a, uh, it's, which is kind of like a, a grant if you were pumping liquid from one side to the other. Okay. And that's how we can pass the, the, um, the fermented liquid or the, uh, the wort through the, uh, to the hops. Now, when you say dry them out, once the hops are dried, they have they give your beer a different flavor. Are they are they a little more bitter when, once they're dried? They tend to lose some of the uh, some of the acid quality when you dry them, but you make up for it in the volume. Okay. So when you dry them, you're, you are going to add a little bit more. But the the beers that you use the dry 
the dry for mm -hmm. probably have a different flavor than the ones that you put in. You're going to get a different flavor from the from the different aspects of when you add the hop to the beer. Okay. So at the boil, you're going to get a certain flavor that way. Um, but but keep in mind too, hops are also a preservative, and so okay. hops will be added as a preservative in many cases, or hops will be added as a bittering agent as well, because the wort is very sweet and sugary, you use the hop to countermeasure or counterbalance the sweet and it knocks down the sweet and makes and can make the beer completely bitter or you can add a ton of it and you're going to get into the India pale ales right. and so on. And so there's the, the, the two definitions that we're searching for at the beginning are, are we using it for flavoring or are we using it for bittering? And then as the process continues in the recipe of the beer, then we're going to add the hops to the different stages of brewing to accomplish the different flavors that we're tr striving for in the many different styles of beers. And then if the brewer just wants to jump off the ship and be creative, then he'll come up with some inventive way of using that hop that nobody else is doing. Now, are you your brewer here or do you have another brewer on no, staff? No, we have a head brewer on staff. Well, Craig, thank you so much for having us out. You have a beautiful establishment, delicious beer. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to coming back and visiting when I'm, when I'm not working. <laughs> yeah, and I need to come visit your, your restaurant. Please do. Thank you for coming. <laughs> we'll be right back. Uh, this week we take a look at a, a new book about working with farm animals. It was written by renowned animal behavior scientist Temple Grandin. Renowned animal behavior scientist Temple Grandin recently published a new book about working with livestock and, and, and how to use humane and safe handling practices on small farms. It is entitled Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals and it's 192 pages in length. The book is divided into three parts, the first of which is all about understanding animal nature. It invites readers to learn how animals perceive the world around them, and it also provides valuable information on livestock genetics and learned behavior. Part two of this book explores the topic of working animals in pastures and pens. Readers will learn how to safely move animals through a chute and, and other handling facilities. The third part teaches people on small farms how to build animal facilities that are both safe and efficient for both the farmer and the animals. Dr. Grandin offers excellent information about the various layouts for corrals and working areas. We strongly believe that any young person who is involved with 4-H and FFA livestock shows, they should have a copy of this book. It teaches principles of animal behavior that will be useful for a lifetime. And as for older readers, hey, you can teach an old dog a new trick every now and then. We highly recommend this book to anyone involved in animal agriculture. Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals is published by Story Publishing and is available through a wide array of sources. Our pearl of wisdom this week comes from one of our original crew members here at Virginia Farming, ace cameraman Dave Mowbray. You know, he may have stolen it from the famous cowboy poet, Will Rogers, but I always think of good old Dave when I hear that sage advice, never squat with your spurs on. If you have a pearl of wisdom you'd like to share with us, you can do it through our website at virginiafarming.com. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming. And now for your ag trivia question of the week, the answer when we return.
Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. Well, the correct answer is B. The top three export markets for Virginia farmers in 2016 were China, Canada, and Switzerland, all filling the same spots they've held since 2013.